writer, Mr. Brendan Farrell. Thank you very much. Uh, traditionally with this show, what I like to do is to make my thanks at the start of the show so that I don't hold people back. Uh, when everybody's in a hurry to maybe get away for a bite to eat or a few pints or whatever it is you're into. Uh, I'd just really like to welcome everybody here tonight to Take Me Home Colleen. Um, it's been 12 months in the make and this is luckily for me my second appearance on, on this stage uh, along with the, the wonderful Dana Barrett who's going to be our narrator and storyteller to, to my right to your left later on. Uh, we're going to be featuring a small bit of acting, which we didn't do before. It's a monologue that we've written. Uh, the wonderful Tommy Ford from Erd uh, who's also a work colleague of mine, is going to deliver an opinion uh, from, from the church's point of view. Um, I don't like this to turn into something political or, uh, you know, nasty, if you like. But there is a story to be told, especially in North Mayo, around the way uh, our people and our ancestors were treated uh, during the, the 1840s. It is known typically as a famine, uh, what happened there, but really and truly wasn't a famine at all because there was a lot of food available. It was just that we, our people, didn't uh, get to eat it. And it, uh, it, it cost a thousand lives in the ground and another thousand souls that sailed the seas to America, UK, and further on to Australia. Um, I have some good news, which is always nice. Uh, I've always worried about the validity of the show and more so, I suppose, my writing. Hiya, girls. We're going to see the girls performing later on as well, the road for the group. Um, the, just last week, I got the news that the, the music from this show has been uh, nominated. It's a national nomination in the Irish Folk Awards for, for the best new coming act uh, up in the Valley Shining. So, You know, I'm, I'm 45 years of age, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a rookie, but, uh, but uh, I, I'm always nervous about the stuff that I've created. Uh, and definitely when I put this show together, I did wonder would it have any vibrance or would it actually have an effect. And it, it seems that it has. So I'm delighted with that. I, I just want you all to really enjoy tonight, to relax. If anybody wants to take photographs or videos, there's no... Uh, there's no problem with that here. Um, just make sure your phone is on silent if that's all right, because it can put me off if it starts ringing in the middle. Uh, I suppose, uh, in terms of American tribute, th this story is one about loss and love. And um, in the last few months, my own father-in-law unfortunately passed away since we did the previous show, so I'm remembering him tonight and right my heart. Uh, and also, I suppose everybody here knows that the, the town of Ballina has been struck, unfortunately, with another tragedy, another tragic episode from Garo Sheikhana, where uh, a neighbour of ours actually as well, Martin Mitchell, passed away suddenly at the weekend. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk off the stage and just give, ask you to give him a round of applause and that's supposed to me. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Balna Art Centre. Before this evening's performance, we have a few announcements. Please make yourself aware of the nearest fire exit. These are located to the right and left of stage and also at the entrance to the auditorium at the rear. In the event of an alarm sounding, please follow directions of staff. There will be a 15 minute interval during which Wine, tea, coffee and minerals are available for sale. Food and drinks are not permitted in the auditorium. We request that you do not use flash photography during the show. Please turn off all mobile phones at this time. Enjoy the performance.
I am Reverend Father Anthony Parr from the parish of Palau in the county of Beale. In 1841, I served the spiritual needs to 593 women. A few years later, in the year of our Lord, 1848, that number was an even 400. 193 homes lost. And lost also were the souls that dwelt within. One third of our people gone. They say that we are surviving a famine. How, I ask you, can this be a famine? When cartloads of food are being evacuated by sea and road on a daily basis. Well-fed soldiers with guns in hand and the law on their side, preparing a path by whatever means. What, say I, can you tell me about the valuation of life? About the cost of death? What can you tell me about the damnation and destruction of a humble and wretched people. What can you teach me about survival? And what can you say to make things better? Nothing. Nothing. Do I question nature? Yes. Do I question mankind? Yes. Do I question God our Father? Yes, yes I do. Questions, questions, questions. And no answers that I can understand. To hear, to hear the cries and pains of a dead farmer's daughter as she rattles the church gate and begs begs for salvation, and me within, me within with nothing to offer only prayer. This hunger, this hunger is destroying our people. The poor of the parish die every day, and those with some means, well they go to shrink to die a different kind of death. Two hundred. Two hundred have run to America. Only three, three have ever returned. The new Bishop of Calabria, Camuso Fini, he has instructed us to offer nothing but prayer, that his purse is empty. And yet, Yet, he guides his flock from behind the palace door. I question his efforts. I question his efforts to submit Rome to charitable ways. In fact, I question whether he contacted them at all. I have seen Rome. The wealth, the commerce, the business of God. They lavish themselves with the best in the world. And to hell with the cost. While their precious flock tumble and fall and rot and die. But to aim the blame solely at Rome is not right either. London and Dublin are the masters of this genocide. Murderous bastards. Murderous bastards that will get their just rewards on Judgment Day. And I know, I know those who are left will blame me for not doing more. But more is something that I don't have. Nothing, nothing is what I have. Nothing but words, 
and compassion and empathy and love. I know of no other nation that has embraced Christianity as this one. I know of no other nation that has immersed itself in Catholicism as this one. I know of no other nation that has given so much to the church as this one. And yet, yet in their most desperate time of need, we, we turned our back on them. I wasn't nailed to the cross. But by God, by God, my people surely were. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Missy Danabert. Sean O'Gahan is from the village of Kalala in County Mayo. He is a peasant farmer, but in no way is he a pauper. His family farm on a tiny holding of land, about an acre, where they grow potatoes and also keep a few hens. Things could be worse. Sean has had to grow up quickly, losing his father, who was also named Sean, several years earlier to fever. Sean is the main breadwinner in his home. His widowed mother, Bridget, and his three younger sisters all depend on him for their survival. The year is 1844, and while life is tough on the west coast of Ireland, they're doing all right. Sean's eldest sister, Sarah, who is 16, gets some work from time to time at the local landlord's estate, where she mends clothes and helps with the milking. The castle in Kalala is owned by Walter J. Burke, a man who is seen to be fair and honest by his tenants. Roseanne and Mary Gohan are 13 and 12 years of age. They help with the chores and receive a little schooling from the local village schoolmaster, Arthur Finnerty. Kalala is a busy place with boats and ships passing through the quay to and from America and other places like England, Western Scotland and wider Europe. There are six public houses, four bakers, six, sh six shops, one saddlers, two cobblers, one carpenter shop and a blacksmith's. Three churches accommodate the spiritual needs of the parishioners from Protestant, Catholic and Methodist faiths. A carriage car taxis people to Balana at 6.30 a.m. every morning. The fishery is controlled by big business and is not accessible as a private enterprise to ordinary folk. All those employed locally in sea fishing are slaves to different masters. There's no such thing as keeping your catch here. Immigration has already taken a hold in Ireland, and over the past 20 years, about 15% of young men and women of the Kalala area have left for America and England. The locals think that this is a desperate state of affairs. Little do they know that worse is yet to come. Ireland is controlled by the British, and Kalala is managed in a particularly harsh manner. The British remember that this was the place where over a thousand men rose against the crown, not 50 years earlier, and they are determined that such a thing will never reoccur. 